close your eyes and just imagine. The smell of wet dirt, burning fuel, and piping hot metal fill the air. The sound of thousands of fans clamoring for a chance to touch death itself. The scream of turbochargers and straight cut gears. An absolute spectacle of fire spitting monsters flying through the forest. The ultimate test of man and machine where drivers pushed their cars and themselves to the absolute limit on treacherous dirt roads and hairpin turns, with crowds of adrenaline-fueled fans cheering them on at every corner. But left virtually unrestricted, the cars got so fast, so quickly, that it wasn't uncommon for a team of drivers to give their lives to the sport. And for the teams that did finish, cars would roll to the end of the stage with blood, hair, and sometimes a finger or two stuck in the bodywork. Hundreds of people were hurt or killed during its short five-year run. And with the future of the race already hanging in the balance with both the drivers and their teams begging for stricter regulations to make things safer, Porsche introduced a car so mind-bendingly quick, the FIA finally said, enough is enough. Now, to be clear, there is no official statement or even any hard evidence to suggest that the 959 is directly responsible for driving the final nail in the coffin for Group B. But the cars had gotten completely out of control, making in excess of 500 horsepower. And when officials laid eyes on Porsche's latest contender, a car so fast, so advanced it could reach speeds in excess of 200 miles an hour, they knew it simply couldn't be allowed to race. Everything had just gotten unmanageable. And we'll never see anything as stupid or as glorious ever again. This is the ideal story of Group B Rally. To understand Group B, you have to understand Rally. And to understand rally, you have to go all the way back to the 1920s. Rally racing was a sort of gentleman's sport, where the men would take their lightly modified production cars and run timed stages in a point-to-point. -point. It was more about navigation and a sense of adventure than it was an all-out race. And while in the 50s and 60s some manufacturers had started developing purpose-built rally cars, like the Lancia Aurelia and Mercedes 300 SL, by the early 70s, Formula One seemed to be the only racing anyone cared about. So in 1973, with the FIA, drivers took what was then the Special Stage Rally and created the World Rally Championship. WRC exploded in popularity, which led to some insane cars and some even more insane drivers. Cars like the Renault 5 Turbo, a front-drive commuter turned mid-engine rally monster. The unbeatable Lancia Stratos HF that was so untouchable the FIA had to change the rules. And of course, the Audi Quattro, which single-handedly brought all-wheel drive to motorsport. But by the late 70s, excitement for rally was, again, dying out. Both the automakers and their drivers wanted more. More freedom to build even crazier cars, not restricted by things like horsepower ratings and aerodynamics. So in 1978, car makers from all over petitioned for such a class, and groups one through six were dead with the stroke of a pen. And groups A, N, and B were born. The man responsible was Jean-Marie Balestra, a controversial authoritarian visionary in the motorsports world. More on him later. Group B was exactly the class that the manufacturers had pleaded for. It was an anything goes, no holds barred, build the craziest thing on four wheels you can sort of situation. And it was an immediate success. The perfect stage for automakers around the globe to show their engineering pedigree. And it was so exciting that it started growing faster than Formula One. Of course, there were some regulations. The cars had to meet a minimum weight, had to have a roof and two seats, and the tires had a width limit. But that was about it. They could build anything with any amount of power out of whatever bargain basement or space age material they could lay their hands on. Cars were sorted into subgroups depending on horsepower, and naturally, homologation was still required. But you only had to make 200 road-going versions of a Group B racer, compared to the 5,000 units required in Group A. And if you wanted to make changes, you only had to build 10% more road cars to make an evolution model race legal. Meaning, you could deploy pretty significant modifications every single year, and only a small number of production cars had to be built as a result. In 1983, at the debut race for Group B, 
Audi entered with the A1, a 340 horsepower turbo 5 cylinder that weighed under 2,500 pounds. Basically, the same car that brought them victory in previous WRC seasons. But Lancia brought something a bit different. This is the Rally 037, built as a dedicated ground up race car for Group B. It was mid engined, rear wheel drive, and designed with help from Pininfarina and a Barth. And although it only made 265 horsepower out of its 2 liter inline four, it dominated the series and launched what would become my favorite David vs. Goliath story in all of motorsports. A story we don't have time to get into in this video. Just halfway through the next year, Audi launches the S1 Quattro with 444 horsepower out of a 2.1 liter inline five. And this car absolutely changed the game. Of course, not to be outdone, Peugeot launched the 205 T16 race car, pushing 43 pounds, or a full three bar of boost pressure, resulting in over 500 horsepower out of a four-cylinder engine. And it was so fast, it not only started setting new speed records basically everywhere it raced, but it went on to win the manufacturer's championship in both 1985 and 1986. Ford came to bat with the now legendary RS200. Nissan showed up with the 240RS. Even brands like Ferrari and Porsche had a seat at the table, with cars like the 308 GTB and the absolutely magnificent 959. And all these incredible machines were piloted by even more incredible drivers, like Walter Rohl, Timo Salonen, Stig Blomquist, Marku Allen, Hanu Mikola, Juha Kenkinen, Michel Mouton, the list goes on. The racing was absolutely thrilling, with at times over 400,000 spectators showing up, who all wanted to be as close to the action as possible, meaning crowds would literally overflow onto the courses themselves. And even though Group B was an absolute sensation and both fans and the automakers couldn't get enough of it, things started getting out of hand. The cars were so outrageously fast that the driving had turned essentially into a string of reactions the human brain simply couldn't keep up. And the fans brought a whole nother factor to the mix. Not only did the drivers have to contend with the spectators standing inches away on the sidelines, but at times they had to play Moses and part their way through the absolute sea of people. And those same people had started throwing things at the cars, placing obstacles on the track, and throwing gravel onto the corners to help their favorite team land a win. The drivers rallied together and petitioned the powers that be to do something to help regulate the crowds. But nothing changed. Group B was bringing in so much cash that they deemed the risks acceptable. In 1985, at the Tour de Corsa rally in Corsica, Attilo Bottega in his Lancia 037 flew off course straight into a tree. Bottega was killed on impact. The co-driver, Marizo, mostly unharmed, limped his way back to the track to warn other cars and flag down an official. It took over 20 minutes for aid to arrive, but there was no point. The car was so mangled, the roof literally torn off, it's a miracle Marizo made it out alive. Again, all the drivers petitioned for a change, and again, nothing happened. That same season, Ari Vatanen had a crash in Argentina, breaking his legs, his ribs, and puncturing a lung. The FIA was all but forced to change the rules to make things safer, so they added stricter requirements on roll cages, but just specifically that you couldn't build them from aluminum anymore. No limits were placed on horsepower, or spectators, or anything that made the actual racing any safer. Then there was Portugal where Joaquim Santos lost control of his Ford RS200 while attempting to avoid a spectator that had run out onto the track, killing three spectators and seriously injuring more than 30 others. So the story goes, Santos' co-driver, Miguel Oliveira, recounts, When you're a co-driver, everything happens too fast. You're forced to look down and read the pace notes and just feel the course around you. But after that swerve, all there was, was bump after bump after bump. He didn't have time to pick his head up and see it, but he felt it all. All those bumps were the car running over people in the crowd. When the car finally came to a stop, Santos was frozen from shock, laying his head on the steering wheel. They had killed three people, including a mother and her 11-year-old child. It was the worst accident in motorsport since the horrific events at the 1955 24-hour of Le Mans. And worse still, 
the race went on. The driver staged at the starting line had no idea what had happened, and it said that at least 11 cars would pass through the gruesome scene. They had to finish the stage to flag down a safety crew. Once the teams had found out what happened, everyone packed up and went back to their hotels, where they came together and signed a handwritten letter addressed to the officials, demanding the rally be stopped. Audi even vowed to pull out of rally altogether, promising they'd never come back unless something was done to make the sport safe. But it didn't matter. Balestra was furious. He wasn't going to let the teams decide what was or wasn't acceptable risk for Group B. He wanted them to know that he was in charge. And so the race carried on through the entire weekend. And if a team refused to race, they'd be seriously penalized. The final straw came in May 1986, when Henri Tovenin and his co-driver Sergio Cresto died in a fiery crash during the Tour de Corsa. Henri told the interviewer at the starting line, This is crazy. We are driving in this rally more kilometers in a day than the whole rally Sweden. It's not about physical fatigue, but mental. Brains do not follow. Those would be the last words he would ever speak. The car was so badly burned there was nothing left but a charred steel roll cage. Following these tragic incidents, Balestra and the FIA had no choice but to ban Group B forever. Despite its short and dangerous history, Group B remains one of the most iconic eras in motorsport. It was chock full of incredible cars and intense competition, and both the drivers and manufacturers are celebrated to this day. It was both the craziest and most wonderful racing the world has ever seen. It was just too dangerous to last. Had it continued, cars like the wickedly fast 959 would have brought the sport to yet another level of insanity. A level of speed where the already high stakes were pushed even higher. Of course, we still have rally to this day, and the 959 went on to win the most grueling race of them all, the Paris Dakar. Rally racing itself has gotten leaps and bounds safer for both the drivers and their fans. But I'm afraid we'll never again in our lifetimes ever see another sport quite like it. This has been the incredible ideal story of Group B Rally. We hope you enjoyed and want to thank you for watching. It's because of you guys we get to keep making these. Go check out this ideal story right here, or go watch whatever YouTube thinks is best for you right over here. I'm Trav, this is Ideal, and we'll see you again next week.